Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. As you can see, I've got a pile of cookbooks out on the countertop. Sort of a representative of, of, of the collection and different variations on the recipe that we're going to do today. We're going to do chili or chili con carne or as some of the recipes in these books call it, Mexican stew. Um, and I wanna talk through the history of, of this recipe a little bit and how it appears in these books and how time and geography change a recipe. So I've got the Dutch oven here on the, on the cooktop, medium heat. I'm gonna put in uh, maybe three tablespoons of bacon fat and I wanna melt that down. Now the recipe I'm using says to use lard, uh, which is great, but I also have bacon fat, so I'm gonna use that because bacon fat is, is better. And I know that in this time period, a lot of the instructions in these books or the ingredients in the ingredient lists, if there is even an ingredient list, isn't about being exact, but just give you an idea. So it would say lard, but it could mean any fat that you have in your kitchen. It wasn't fully prescriptive, it was more descriptive. So I've got that, we'll just let that come up to temperature. Now, chili, chili con carne, uh, historians generally accept that the first chili recipe published in a cookbook doesn't appear until the Mrs. Owens cookbook in 1880. Now this is the third printing from 1883 and by 1883 the recipe's gone. They've taken it out. Um, it wasn't deemed to be a very important recipe so it's taken out completely. It's not in here and I'd still love to get a copy of the original 1880 so that I could look at it. Most people say that it's called chili, it has elements of chili, but it's got a white sauce that's mixed in. Um, and the white sauce isn't necessarily <laughs> something that you usually find in a chili. So next in, I've got some beef and I've got it cubed up and that goes in and we're just gonna start frying that off. Pan could have been hotter, but it's starting to sizzle. So leave that to brown. Now, since there's probably already people in the comment section from Texas typing in their comment, let's address the elephant in the room. Let's start with origin story. None of the origin stories that I hear most loudly and most often do I believe. I believe, sincerely believe, that roasted meat or, or cooked meat, stewed meat with chili peppers um, goes back millennia and that this idea that it was uh, European settlers who came and started making this out on the open range while they were you know chasing cattle ignores thousands of years of history of what was happening on this continent um, before Europeans arrived. Sure beef, beef would be a new addition but other forms of meat that were already here would have been stewed with chilies long before Westerners or Europeans arrived. The next thing that I'm probably gonna have to discuss is the Texas connection, because chili, Texas, Texas chili. I have two cookbooks here from Texas. Um, the first one is from Gebhards, and Gebhards is a company that makes chili powder. It was in this time period, in the 1800s, early 1900s, one of the most famous companies for making chili powder. And they've got a, they've got a, a homemade chili, chili con carne recipe that is very sparse, not a whole lot of ingredients, which makes me you know, think that it's pretty close to real. Then we get to this cookbook, um, and I'm gonna duck. It's from Marshall, Texas. And last time I checked, Marshall, Texas was in Texas. The chili con carne recipe in this book has tomatoes, beans, pimiento, and kitchen bouquet. There's no mention of chili actually in it. Um, paprika, I guess, is, the, is what they're calling pimiento, paprika. So not, doesn't fit with the theory or what the you know contemporary Texas chili, beanless chili is. But when you get into these other cookbooks, um, 1800s, early 1900s, the farther north you get, the more you're gonna see beans. And part of that I believe is, there's, two, there's a bunch of things going on. In Texas, people I, I've spoken to say that you serve beans on the side. 
at some point, some cook is going to say, why am I serving the beans on the side? Why am I not just cooking them in since everybody's just mixing everything together on their plate anyway? They're mixing the beans and everything together. Why am I not just putting the beans in the pot? Another part of it is there would probably be a lot of bean stews with chili peppers where someone had a meager amount of meat and they put the meat into that. And so there's this sort of confluence of two different ideas or two different dishes that become something else. And that idea of beans, when you get into the 1930s and the depression years, beans are something in this dish that extend the protein, a cheap, readily available protein source that extends the meat or in most cases, maybe even replaces the meat. And I think that's an important distinction. And I'm okay with beans in my chili. I really am. A great recipe that we come to that I want to talk about is from this cookbook right here. It's called Recipes Compiled from, contributed by the women of circle number one of the Presbyterian Auxiliary and others, Cotton Plant, Arkansas, 1927. And it's got a couple of recipes in here. Um, there's one called Mexican Stew, and it contains potatoes. It is essentially the recipe we're making today, but it contains potatoes. And I think potatoes are a very interesting, um, very interesting addition to a chili recipe in that contemporary 2022, three weeks ago when I was in Mexico, in Mexico City, I saw lots of what I would consider a chili, beef, chili, um, a couple of other spices, and potatoes. And so... From a contemporary lens, what's happening in that cookbook from Arkansas in 1927, I think is something that is not out of place in today's, uh, today's marketplace. Okay, that beef is looking good and brown. So now in go some onions. So I guess that brings us next to tomatoes. Um, the recipe we're making today does contain tomatoes. And most of these recipes do. The one here from Gebhard's, there is no tomato. Um, this one from Arkansas, let me just check it again just to make sure because they're getting confused in my brain. No tomatoes, it's just water and, and the chili, chili pepper and the onions and the beef and the clove of garlic. But the farther away you get, you do start to see tomatoes in it. Um, these two are interesting to me. These two books, I'm going to bring them a little bit closer. It's so many books on the go. Um, so the recipe that I'm doing today, I'm not going to tell you about it until we get a little closer to the end. Put the onions in and I'm supposed to fry it down a little bit. And I think I've reached the point where we now add in, it says a half a cup of water or stock. Put that in, I'm gonna scrape up off the bottom and put a lid on and I'm gonna turn that down. And it says that we stew till meat is tender. So these two books, uh, one is from Illinois and this one is the Congressional Cookbook. Um, recipes submitted by Congress people from across the United States. Uh, recipes that they think are representative of where they're from. Um, and so this recipe is from Wisconsin, so I, I don't know, but both of these recipes have chili, chili con carne, with spaghetti as an ingredient. And that kind of, that kind of brings me to a crossover with Cincinnati chili. Um, different animal altogether, but it is spaghetti with a spiced meat sort of chili type base, which comes back to this book from Gebhardt's in Texas. Um, in the 1920s, Gebhardt's was selling canned chili, so ready-made, just heated up chili. They also had spaghetti in chili in a can. So this idea of serving chili over spaghetti um, can be linked right back to the 1920s or the early 1900s in Texas. And so what I've got here is the Tennessee cookbook. This is published in 1912. It has a recipe for chili con carne. And the instructions are make the scotch stew, which is the recipe previous, add one quart can of tomatoes run through a sieve, 
add three tablespoons of chili powder, cook until juice of tomatoes is absorbed. That's their chili con carne recipe. And if you go back a page though, there's another recipe here called Mexican stew. And that is much closer to what we're making today. And it's even rounded out a little bit better because it has oregano and comino as well as the chili powder. So you've got that sort of thing. This is the Mississippi cookbook. This is from 1922. And in here, it's got four, five, it's got five chili con carne recipes. And they sort of look like all of the major variations are happening here in these recipes. It's not one thing. It's not one thing at all. Um, you get to this cookbook. This is the mixing bowl. This is from Welland, Ontario. Um, Welland is just sort of uh, sort of southwest of us here, close to the American border, close to Buffalo. Closer to Buffalo than I am to Buffalo, anyway. Um, and this is from the 1930s. And this is an example of, the recipe in here is an example, and I'm not making fun of this person at all, but the recipe is an example of how an idea travels. And traveling with that idea is sort of the name, but none of it works. And it's called Chili Kill Carney. So they've sort of got the idea, um, and you're putting in rice, onion, uh, butter, pepper, salt, and a dash of cayenne along with the hamburger steak and tomato. And so they've sort of got the idea, but they haven't quite got the idea yet. Okay, let's check the pot. Oh, look at that. That's looking really good. You've got some really deep brown flavors happening in the bottom of that pot. Okay, so lid back on, let it go. And so that brings us to the recipe that we're actually cooking today. It is from this cookbook, the Toronto Queen City of Canada cookbook. This was published here in Toronto in 1915. And it has two um, chili recipes. It has a uh, chili con carne, beef chili con carne, um, which is not, again, it's, this is not quite right. They use sweet chili peppers instead of hot chili peppers. Um, they're using fresh chili peppers, so fresh, like, bell peppers, I would imagine. Um, not quite right, but there is, uh, you put in a little bit of, uh, put in a little garlic, salt and pepper. So, not spicy, not spicy at all. This is, I'm, in the time period, 1915, in Toronto, this would probably be, you know, really good. And if you put in red sweet bell peppers, people would think it was hot because it had red bits in it. Um, just because my family grew up here, I, I kind of know what's going on. A couple pages over though, they have this recipe for chili con carne. And it's beef, kidney or mutton, four large dried red chili peppers. Um, they don't say which ones to use, but you know, if you're getting the dried ones, they're probably hot. They're from Mexico or from the South. Large onion, small can of tomatoes, and a couple of sections of garlic. That's it. So there's no, there's no oregano, there's no cumin, um, things that I would think that would go really well in this dish, but... And it talks about the history of the dish. And this recipe in this cookbook in 1915 really surprises me. Surprises me a lot. Um, and I, I, I think of it as one of those aspirational recipes. You know, if you, um, if you bought a cookbook today, and you saw this really wild exotic recipe in the cookbook and you had to go out and you had to order special ingredients in order to make it. Uh, that's kind of what's going on here. Uh, in Toronto in 1915, I imagine dried hot chili peppers were relatively difficult to get. So I'm just gonna, I need to soak these in hot water. So I'm just gonna get those ready. Okay, so what I did was Took the seeds and the stems out. Just cut them up with a pair of scissors, and now I'm gonna pour some hot water over them just to soften them up. And then after they're softened, put them into a blender, along with a little bit of the water that we used to soften them. Okay, that beef is looking good. 
looking fantastic. That's simmering away nicely. Now, we add in the tomatoes. The garlic. And the chili. Now, the recipe itself says that I was supposed to pass the tomato and the chili through a sieve. Um, because in 1919, they didn't have the technology that we have today. But I am pretty sure that Mrs. Powell, who wrote this cookbook, would have, if she had it available to her, been using this Blendtec blender. Um, blends anything. And she would have been very happy to use it. Uh, why stay in the past if you don't have to? So I'm just going to stir this together. Now it just tells me to stew it all together for a short time and just before service I'm supposed to season it with salt. Put the lid back on and let it stew away. Beans and some of that chili. Look at that. Hey, Jules. Hey, Glenn. Hey, friends. I don't know. Fork, spoon? Fork, spoon? Maybe spoon? I will try spoon. So instead of beans, I'm having refried beans because I really wanted refried beans tonight. And I wanted to open a conversation about refried beans. When we were in Mexico with on the Glenn and Friends trip, Yes. people were talking about which beans you refry. Yes, black versus pinto. Yeah, and so when we were in Oaxaca, it was always black beans, wasn't it? Or have I got that reversed? No, I think we only had black beans. Really? I only had black beans most of the time I was there. Okay. So, pinto beans or black beans, what do you refry and where do you live? Let us know down in the comments. So, this is chili or chili con carne. Mm -hmm. oh, that's really good. It's quite good. Now it's, I'm going to have some with beans just because. So it's not, it's really flavorful. It's not overly hot. No, and it's not just chili, chili spice flavor. Like I don't actually like chili. It's just. Julie doesn't like chili powder chili. Mm -mm. A little bit of rice, some beans. That's good. Mm -hmm. I'm in. <laughs> okay. So what have we learned? <laughs> um, make it however you want. Well, exactly. I mean, it appears. It appears. I'm guessing. A, it appears in a bunch guess. of books. There's Mexican stew, which is essentially this, but has adds potatoes. I think potatoes, potatoes would, be, would be good. Would be really good in that. Sometimes Mexican stew had tomatoes, and sometimes it didn't have tomatoes, but it always had potatoes. Then you move on to chili or chili con carne, and sometimes it was like this, with or without tomatoes, depending on the recipe with or without some other spices, depending on the recipe. And then you move a little bit farther north, where it was usually ground beef, tomatoes, beans, chili powder, what we grew up as calling, yeah, calling chili. chili. And then you move to like Wisconsin, where they put in spaghetti. And I think spaghetti would be really good in it. it would be good on spaghetti. It would be really good in it. So anyway, again. Um, no judging. No judging. Beans, <laughs> no I beans. my stern face. It mm. doesn't matter, down through history, this is a recipe that has changed from where it began, you know, thousands of years ago to where it is today and all of the in-between. Just make it how you like it, but that's really good. And I'm surprised it came from a cookbook in Toronto in 1915. They talk about, she goes on in the story to talk about mole and mm. how you should get a molcajete in order to make this correctly. And it just blows my mind that it's in that, that, it's in that cookbook. It sometimes amazes me the things that were available during D different eras yeah. that are may or may not be available to me T today. today. Yes. Um, yeah. I just it always just blows my mind. But I'm going to sit down and have supper. So give this one a shot. I think it's really good. It's a great starting point for all kinds of other things, but it's really good just the way it is. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.